Good afternoon, everyone. I was warned not to tap the microphone, so I'm going to keep hands off. I'm going to keep my hands up here. Knowing my uh, technical abilities, I'm only muck it up. That's, uh, that, that's inevitable. Uh, I'm Ken Yalowitz, the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm very, very happy uh, to welcome you to the first in what will be a series uh, of four presentations uh, on the Middle East, um, and particularly uh, the events leading up to the recent war um, in Gaza, looking at some of the historical uh, antecedents, the current situation, and then also uh, looking forward. Um, we are joined at the Dickey Center by the Rockefeller Center and also uh, Dartmouth Hillel, and Rabbi Borez is, is right here. Uh, we three are co-sponsoring uh, this series of uh, four talks, and it's very possible that uh, future events uh, will be sponsored by other organizations. I'd also mention um, that there is an organization called the Dartmouth Center's Forum, uh, in which uh, the Dickey Center, the Rockefeller Center, Tucker Foundation, and a variety of others are all members. And um, there are 10 of us all together uh, from Dartmouth. And we have come together um, to do a series of joint programs based on a single common theme. Uh, and the theme this year is conflict and reconciliation. And there are a series of programs. I don't know if any of you attended. Uh, we had Senator George Mitchell, who was here last September. Uh, but that was one of the uh, events. And today's talk uh, and also the series of four uh, are also being uh, supported by the Dartmouth Center uh, Forum. And as I wanted to say earlier, this is the first of four events um, over the winter and spring term <clears throat> providing different perspectives on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I will just mention uh, that in the future, uh, we, uh, we now, including today's speaker, the Israeli Consul General uh, from Boston, uh, who is speaking today, we have two other confirmed speakers, uh, Professor Amani Jamal of Princeton, uh, a Palestinian-American political scientist who specializes in democracy uh, in the Arab world. She will be speaking in May. And then also Mr. Gordon Zacks, uh, a businessman, a Zionist, who will be speaking in May as well. And we have sent uh, invitations to the Chargé d'Affaires of the Palestine Liberation Organization mission in Washington, uh, Dr. Nabil Abuznaid, and also to uh, Sarah Roy, a, an economics professor at Harvard who has studied Palestinian society for the last three decades. So amongst uh, those individuals, we will have uh, the next three speakers. And as I said, our aim, our intention is to provide a variety of perspectives, a variety of viewpoints, uh, which is very much in keeping uh, with, with the Dickey Center's aim of uh, informing, educating the Dartmouth student community about the major current issues of the day, uh, and equally important, uh, trying to develop a commitment on your part uh, to do something about those issues. And today, I am very delighted to welcome uh, the Consul General of Israel, uh, resident in Boston. He is Consul General of Israel to New England, uh, and is in you know is resident uh, in Boston. Uh, Mr. Nadav Tamir, whose subject today will be Israel and the Middle East after the crisis in Gaza, and if I may add, after the elections as well uh, from yesterday. So I'll just add that uh, parenthetical. Um, Mr. Nadav joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1993 and in the following year began to serve as the policy assistant to the foreign minister. He has had the privilege to serve under three Israeli foreign ministers, Shimon Peres, Ehud Barak, and David Levy. Uh, he was then promoted to the position of political officer uh, of the Israeli embassy in Washington in 1997. 
and in 2001, uh, he was given the position of advisor to the Director General uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Jerusalem. And I can tell you from my own experience in the Foreign Service that that's the kind of a position that's reserved for the best of the best. Uh, in 2003, uh, Mr. Nadav was chosen as a Wexner Israel Fellow and earned his Master's in Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard in 2004. And prior to joining the uh, ministry, he served as a security officer at the residence of the President of Israel while simultaneously earning his BA in Philosophy and Political Science from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, from which he graduated magna cum laude. Now please join me in welcoming our Consul General uh, Nadab Tamir. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Yalovich and uh, Rabbi Boras for inviting me here. It's a great uh, opportunity for me to be in this wonderful um, a, a university, um, a rivalry of, uh, of Harvard in the Ivy League, but still uh, we have a lot of respect uh, to your university. And um, uh, wh when I got off the car, I thought that maybe I made a mistake and I drove south because it so was so warm. But now that I know that it's not so bad, I'll, I'll try to come here more often. <laughs> um, because I do want to have an opportunity to speak to you about Israel, not just in terms of the politics and the, and the conflict. There are so many other aspects to Israel, but I know that right now uh, what's on your mind, and naturally so uh, after the tragedy in Gaza, is, uh, is more the political situation, and, and I'll, I'll try to address that. And as um, you heard, we had yesterday elections in Israel. We have elections in Israel too often, so it's not that dramatic. Uh, but still, um, it's a big question mark how those elections will end up in terms of what government, and I could only speculate. I don't have clear answers, unfortunately. Um, but I will try to, to speak about, um, about the situation in the Middle East, but because you are you know, from, uh, from this great university and probably more sophisticated, I just don't want just to talk about current events, but to try to actually uh, zoom out and give some perspective both from the regional um, aspects of Gaza and, uh, and the after Gaza situation and the internal Israeli perspective and that will also lead us to the election and why I think the elections uh, uh, you know results were as they were and where is it leading. Um, so I would start by saying that before I'm even talking about Gaza I think that uh, those of you who are uh, watching the Middle East for the last few years uh, would notice, and maybe many of us don't notice because as uh, we all know, it's very hard to change an old paradigm before the new paradigm is very clear. But we feel that there is a new paradigm on the, in the Middle East. Uh, in the past, when you spoke about the conflict in the Middle East, it was quite clear that you're talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. That was the story. Uh, and all, all the rest was footnotes. Um, right now, it seems that in the last few years, the real conflict in the Middle East is a different one. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Israeli-Arab conflict still play a role and sometimes is being used for the other conflict, which I, I really want to talk about. And the other conflict is what will be the future of the Middle East? Will it be a Middle East that is connected to uh, modernity, to globalization, to uh, the Western world, or will it be uh, a Middle East that is um, controlled by, um, by Islamist uh, ideology? And, and the lines of this conflict are not, uh, are not in Israel, are mostly in the Arab and Muslim world. Actually, we all focused on the tragedy in Gaza, but if you even do the, the numbers for the last few years, you'll find out that most of the people that got killed in the Middle East uh, were Muslims killed by Muslims, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or Indonesia or Lebanon or the Palestinian Authority, we see a clear uh, realignment of forces where, for example, in the Palestinian Authority, we see uh, the moderate um, government of the Palestinian Authority headed by Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad. And on the other side, you see Hamas and Islamic Jihad. 
You see the same story in Lebanon. You see on the one hand the Senora government and on the other hand uh, Hezbollah. And you see on the one hand uh, outside of the immediate area um, many countries like Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, most of the Gulf countries, most of the Maghreb countries on the one side of the divide and mostly Iran uh, with some alliance of convenience with Syria and its proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, and other organizations. And you see this um, confrontation uh, in many ways, in many areas. Um, it's mostly started with uh, uh, countries where there are more, uh, uh, more significant Shia population uh, because Iran uh, in attempts to um, export the Khomeini revolution to other places in the Middle East, we're focusing on places where it's easier uh, naturally for them uh, because of, of a larger Shiite uh, population. So you see in Iraq, where there is majority of Shiite, you see Lebanon, where there is uh, um, maybe even there a majority of Shiite, even though we, we don't have clear numbers. Um, uh, you see Iran very active in trying to export this ideology, and you see other countries and other organizations are on the other side of the divide, more in the American orbit than the Iranian orbit, and a very um, a dramatic um, a joking for position in the Middle East between the West and between Iran and its proxies. Of course, there is also the Al-Qaeda um, phenomena, but it's, it's, I think, less in our immediate area. You see it more in, uh, in Afghanistan, in Sudan, in, in other places. Uh, but in our areas, it's mostly about, about Iran and its proxies. Um, this is a very uh, new phenomenon for us because on the one hand, it's very frightening. Um, Iran, um, not only calling to wipe Israel off the map, but actually trying to get the means to do it, uh, working with, with their proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, that are clearly um, uh, want Israel out of the Middle East, um, using asymmetric uh, warfare against, uh, against us, um, uh, but on the other hand, there is a big opportunity out there for us because for the same first time in our history, we have the same goals with many of our neighbors, with the Egyptians, with the Jordanians, with the Saudis, with the Maghreb countries, Morocco, Tunisia, um, you know, even Libya, when if you saw the, the op-ed by, by Muammar Gaddafi that I don't agree with the bottom line, which supports a one-state solution, but I think there is a lot more empathy to Israel being uh, a legitimate uh, uh, country in the Middle East. Um, and the first time that we have you know, the same goals on the big picture, of course, we have many disagreements with many of those players, but the big uh, the, the strategy to have a Middle East that is, uh, that is stable, that is prosperous, uh, and, and, uh, and all those parties see the same uh, resolution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict around the two-state solution, Israel and Palestine uh, living in peace and security side by side. Um, and in many ways, uh, what you saw um, in the war we had with Hezbollah in 2006, and I'm intentionally saying a war with Hezbollah and a, not a war with Lebanon, because that's the way we saw it, and again, a war with Hamas uh, right now, which was definitely, uh, at least uh, uh, in our eyes, not a war with Palestinian people, but a war with Hamas, is very much part of this new regional uh, realignment of, of forces. Um, and, uh, um, and we'll get there when we'll talk about how to move forward, but one of the most important uh, manifestation of this new realignment is what is called the Arab or Saudi initiative. Um, uh, that. Um, um, calls uh, that most of those Arab countries say that whenever Israelis and Palestinians will solve their problems, uh, the Arab world will back whatever solution the Israelis and Palestinians will get, which I have to admit took a lot of time for people in Israel to really understand how dramatic and how strategic it is. At first, we were too busy in looking at all the language and saying what we agree with and what we don't agree, but we didn't really see the big picture there, which is that those countries actually accept Israel and uh, know that Israel is going to be part of the Middle East. Uh, and that's very different than the situation we had uh, in the past, the three no's of Khartoum after 67 and, uh, and the clear position of many of those countries 
uh, that uh, did not accept uh, Israel legitimacy in the Middle East. Um, so this is kind of the, of the uh, uh, regional um, uh, background to, I th to, what happened, um, to what happened in Gaza, and I'll go back to it when, I, when I'll speak more directly about Gaza. From the Israeli perspective, what led to Gaza was uh, a history where, uh, and I don't want to go you know, too, uh, too far uh, in history, but I would say that um, uh, for quite some time, definitely since 93, um, uh, um, most Israelis, around 80% of Israelis in any polls that you do, accept the fact that the only way to achieve peace with the Palestinians is uh, through a two-state solution. And not only the only way to achieve peace with the, with the Palestinians, but actually the only future for Israel as, a, as both a democracy and a homeland of the Jewish people. Because it's quite clear that if we will not separate the land between Jordan and the sea, between us and the Palestinians, we will face two uh, scenarios. One, that the, we will control their life and we will not be a democracy. Second, it will be a binational state, which means an end to the dream of, of the Jewish people to have sovereignty uh, and, and, and control of our destiny. Um, so it's quite clear to most Israelis uh, that we have to separate ourselves from the Palestinian and create a Palestinian state living side by side with Israel in peace and security. So at first, uh, during the Oslo times, um, the idea was to do it incrementally. The idea of Oslo was, uh, first of all, we recognized each other, PLO recognized Israel, we recognized them, and then we started to talk uh, and to try to solve small issues uh, in order to eventually, when we we'll get to the tough issues, uh, Jerusalem, refugees, borders, um, the assumption was that we will get enough trust between us and we will be able to tackle it uh, much, much easier and there will be much more support from the public to a compromise and the big bargain. And everybody understood that the big bargain eventually is that the, we will have to give up uh, our natural connection to uh, places in the West Bank that are cradle of the Jewish people, uh, as you can read in the Bible, because uh, if you look forward, you have to realize that, uh, you know, that the future is more, more important than the past. And the Palestinian people will have to do the same in giving up their connection, or at least sovereignty, over Jaffa and Haifa and places in proper Israel. That is the big bargain. And the Oslo uh, uh, rationale was to get there incrementally. Well, we all know that that failed. And uh, the last thing I want is to get into the blame game. I would just say that spoilers from both sides were very busy to uh, work against it. So we, we saw, on the one hand, uh, buses exploding in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, the old suicide uh, uh, bomber uh, phenomena. On the other hand, uh, side, you saw um, uh, is, uh, settlements being built uh, and settlers treating the Palestinians in a very inhuman way. Um, and instead of getting more trust, we lost trust, and eventually the, the, the whole concept of Oslo collapsed. And then what happened usually in Israeli uh, politics, and, and it will lead us later to the election, whenever Israelis feel unsafe, they become more hawkish. Whenever they feel safer, they become more forthcoming and they press the government to do something about, about peace. So uh, after Oslo, when people felt very unsafe, I remember I worked with Shimon Peres after the assassination of, of Prime Minister Rabin, and Shimon Peres was running all over the world trying to get support for the Palestinian economy, and people told him, what are you talking about peace when, when uh, buses are exploding and we have terror terrorism in the cities of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and eventually he lost the elections, and Bibi Netanyahu became the Prime Minister. And uh, we had some, uh, uh, some uh, years where they were trying to kind of move forward, um, but, uh, but nobody really spoke about a conflict um, resolution, but rather on conflict management. And then, again, the pendulum moved in Israeli politics after some years when uh, safety came back to Israel and people went to the left, and Ehud Barak became prime minister. And Ehud Barak said, you know, Oslo didn't work because of incrementalism. I'm going to do it very differently. I'm going to get uh, Clinton and Arafat to Camp David, and we will put all those issues in one basket, you know, refugees, Jerusalem, borders, and we will come out with a big 
a, a solution to the problem after uh, closing the doors of Camp David, staying there as much, you know, as long as we can. And again, as we all know, this failed miserably. And instead of having a big um, a, a peace agreement we had, we came back to a very uh, miserable uh, bloodshed uh, that used to call the Second Intifada, where uh, many Palestinians and Israelis lost their life, and it was very tragic. Um, and again, I don't want to go, to go into the blame game. Who is to blame for the failure of Camp David? Uh, we would probably uh, can split the blame somehow between all of the players, the Americans, the Israeli, the Palestinians. Uh, we have our own narrative. Palestinians have their own narrative, but I always feel that it's not very constructive to get stuck in those narratives, but to look forward. And the, uh, res the clear result, it was, it was a failure. And Israelis came back feeling still, we have to somehow separate between us and the Palestinians, but we have no partner. That was the feeling in Israel. And I'm not saying if it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Palestinians have a different narrative, but that was the feeling in Israel. And there was a lot of confusion. And again, whenever Israelis feel uh, under threat, they go to the right. And they, uh, uh, and they uh, elected Ariel Sharon, who was considered uh, very hawkish, uh, the father of the, of the settlements project. Uh, and Ariel Sharon, actually, when we became prime minister, when he stopped the rhetoric of, of, of politics and he actually uh, looked at the problems at hand, he realized just what most Israelis realize, that we have to somehow separate ourselves from the Palestinians and create a Palestinian state. But he said, okay, if we have no partner, we'll have to do it unilaterally. Uh, and he actually got amazing support from all over uh, the political spectrum in Israel to do exactly that in Gaza, to leave Gaza, to move the settlements and to move uh, the IDF from Gaza. And the idea was to um, build a model for uh, the two-state solution in Gaza, hoping that Gaza, and actually uh, Sharon had two assumptions about leaving Gaza. One, it will be a, a successful model. The Palestinians will run their own life. We will not be uh, blamed for uh, not letting their, uh, them run their own life and they will be able to make a success out of it because the world will of course support it, the Arab world will support it and uh, eventually uh, this success will be able to implement in the West Bank. Uh, the, other, uh, the other assumption that he made was that if we will still be attacked from Gaza we will get the world support because it was quite clear we're not in there and if we get missiles or whatever from Gaza we will be able to react with the support of the international community. And of course, those two assumptions didn't work. Uh, first of all, um, instead of, of uh, Gaza becoming a model uh, for uh, Palestinians running their own life, it became a hub of terrorism. The rockets kept on coming to Israel even when we were there, but uh, when we left there even ma more. And eventually, Hamas were elected to, uh, to, uh, to have a majority in the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council, and uh, shortly afterwards, they actually took Gaza by force from the administration, who was still Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, in a very brutal uh, coup d'etat, they took Gaza by force, and then the whole situation really deteriorated, and, and the rockets getting into Israel became much more intensified. Um, and again, the other assumption that the world will care um, proved uh, absolutely not wrong, because for eight years, missiles were going into uh, towns in the southern part of Israel, and for the international community, it was just like the weather report. We were talking about this, and in Israel, there was more and more anxiety, and whenever you went outside of Israel, nobody even knew about this. And we, the diplomats, absolutely failed in getting the world to know about the suffering in Sderot, mainly Sderot. Sderot is a very, is a hardworking um, uh, immigrant uh, town in the vicinity of Gaza that was the, ma the main victim of most of those rockets. And people in Zderot were looking to their government and saying, what are you doing to help us? Why aren't you stopping this? And the government was very reluctant because we knew that when we will act, it will be ugly. That's the way it usually works. Um, and we were looking for different ways. And people in Zderot felt many, in many ways like people in New Orleans during Katrina. They felt we were in the periphery, nobody cares about us. If it was New York or Boston or, in Israeli terms, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, you know, you would definitely do something, but nobody cares about us because in the, we are in the periphery. And it was a very tough situation uh, for them and for the government. And, and people don't realize because people look at the numbers and actually 
And you know, uh, uh, in, in according to the numbers, we didn't have many fatalities because we um, made most of those kindergarten into shelters and we had uh, an alarm that, uh, uh, 15 that gave you 15 seconds to go to the shelter when you hear the alarm, the red alarm. And so according, you know, for the, the, for the media, it wasn't dramatic enough. There wasn't many deaths. But for the kids there who knew that, you know, they have 15 seconds to get to, to a shelter and for the parents who felt so helpless in, you know, in giving their kids just what, you know, sending them to, to, to school, feeling safe, it was just a miserable situation that was absolutely not sustainable. Eventually, uh, uh, through the uh, mediation of the Egyptians, we were able to achieve a ceasefire. Um, the, we, you know, Hamas don't speak to us, we don't speak to them, so it was all us speaking to the Egyptians, the Egyptians speaking to the Hamas, and eventually the Egyptians were uh, able to uh, achieve a ceasefire. We wanted that the ceasefire will include the release of Gilad Shalit, a soldier that is uh, in captivity for more than two years, but we didn't get this. And we also knew that this ceasefire is very flawed because we knew that, this, that the tunnels from Egypt to uh, Gaza are still open and, and weapons and ammunition and missiles are coming from Iran uh, through Africa to Egypt, getting into those tunnels. And, we, and many people in Israel said, listen, this ceasefire is going to backfire because they're getting more and more weapons and at some point they decide they don't want the ceasefire anymore and they will be m so much stronger. But the government said, when, you know, we, we, we learned the lesson from Lebanon. We know that, uh, you know, uh, that it's very hard when you deal with asymmetric threats, when we deal with organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas who actually want to provoke you, who actually want to use not only your, your civilian, but their civilian in order to uh, deaths and, and injuries, in order to promote their agenda uh, and to get support from the world. And we, d we knew that it's going to be ugly and, and we agreed to the ceasefire. And the ceasefire held for quite some time. There were disagreements between Hamas and us about the terms of the ceasefire because there was no document. Uh, we spoke to the Egyptians, they spoke to the Egyptians, and, and the only judge to say who was right uh, in claiming that the other one was, uh, you know, not uh, standing to the, uh, to the ceasefire was the Egyptians. And, uh, uh, and it caused a lot of problems. But in any event, um, while most of you probably were in Christmas break, uh, Hamas decided that December 19th is, is, is the time to stop the ceasefire. And I could speculate what, what were, uh, why they decided it. But I was amazed to see the pundits here who actually didn't know anything about the eight years of rockets saying, why did Israel choose that time? Was it because of the Israeli elections that politicians were joking for, for power in Israel and popularity? Or was it because of the American election that Israel was trying to use this a window between uh, the uh, Bush administration and, and the Obama administration. Well, the truth, the reality was it wasn't Israel's choice. The timing was absolutely uh, the, the, the choice of Hamas. And Israel tried to renew the ceasefire. Amos Gilad, our negotiator, who's uh, equivalent to undersecretary for policy in, in, in the Defense Department, was going back and forth to Egypt trying to renew this ceasefire that we knew it was flawed because actually the politicians knew that uh, according to the war with Hezbollah that it's very risky, nobody wanted it, uh, especially not before elections, uh, but uh, those efforts failed. And on Christmas Day, my boss, Tsipi Livni, uh, the foreign minister, was in Egypt trying to renew the ceasefire, and in the same day, 80 rockets fell on Sderot, and this time it was not only Sderot, it was much more, it was Ashkelon, Beersheba, uh, Gedera, getting closer and closer to the suburbs of Tel Aviv, and it was quite clear that it's not sustainable and we have to do something. Um, uh, and, and when I'm trying to think what was uh, the rationale for Hamas to decide that they don't want the ceasefire any, anymore, uh, I, I can only speculate, and I know that there are some experts here about uh, Palestinians who might have different uh, perspective, but I think that what uh, Hamas were seeing, and not only Hamas Gaza, you have to understand that part of Hamas leadership is in Damascus. Khaled Mish'al sits in Damascus and is very influenced by Syria and Iran. And what they were seeing is that the situation in the West Bank actually is, be, is getting better. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that this year, uh, the Christmas celebrations in Bethlehem were the best since 2000. 
hotel rooms were full, and the economy was starting to pick up, a lot because of this prime minister of the Palestinian Authority, Salam Fayyad, who's very well respected by the international. Uh, he worked at the IMF. He knows many, many Americans and Western uh, economists, and many people trusted him, unlike the previous Fatah administrations that had, you, were perceived to be corrupt. Salam Fayyad is definitely not corrupt. And with a lot of help from Tony Blair and, uh, uh, and many efforts to really promote the, the uh, Palestinian economy, the, the situation in, in, in West Bank was improving. And on the north side of the West Bank, in near Jenin, we saw another great success, which is uh, an American general, uh, General Dayton, with some help with General Jones, who's now the National Security Advisor, were training the Palestinian uh, Authority um, forces, and they were getting good at it. And the, our generals, who are usually very suspicious of the PA uh, forces, becoming more and more um, uh, relaxed and started to trust, and they're becoming to, uh, they started to work together, and that allowed Israel to be much less intrusive and much less defensive, which allows in the north uh, uh, part of the West Bank uh, much freer movement, less checkpoints, and the situation was improving. And Hamas were seeing that, and they felt that their numbers were getting lower because Palestinians were saying, you're not delivering, you're now controlling Gaza, you are responsible. You can't say that you, know, uh, you, you are, will do better than the Fatah when we see that the Fatah are doing much better. And the, I, m my source for, uh, for Palestinian public opinion is uh, someone who spoke here, I heard, Khalil Shkaki, a, a Palestinian professor in, uh, that he's partially in Brandeis teaching, so I have a, a chance to hear from him. And he was telling, uh, he was saying that the numbers for Hamas were, uh, were going down, less popularity, and that's one of the reasons. Another reason, I think, is that uh, um, Iran and Syria, and I'm going back to the regional perspective, we're seeing the Annapolis process. We're seeing this effort to get the Arab uh, moderate countries to support the talks uh, between uh, Abu Mazen, uh, who you call him Mahmoud Abbas, in the Middle East we call him Abu Mazen, and our Prime Minister Olmert, who had thousands of hours of, of conversations, uh, and the same with Tsipi Livni, the Foreign Minister, and Abu Allah, the Palestinian negotiator, talking about the political horizon, because the Annapolis process was based on the fact that we'll both have a support from the moderate Arabs who all went to, to Annapolis for this summit, but it was uh, based on another assumption. We will not wait for the roadmap, which means first si change of situation on the ground to talk about the, the political horizon. We'll do it in parallel. We'll have conversation about the political horizon <coughs> because without political horizon, it's very hard for Mahmoud Abbas to really change the situation on the ground. People uh, find it hard to deal with Hamas when they have no hope. So the idea was let's create hope to the Palestinians by those negotiations, and meantime, with the help of Tony Blair, uh, uh, who used to be Prime Minister of Get Britain and now the uh, Quartet representative, and with General Dayton, improve the situation on the ground, and eventually we will be able to influence opinion, uh, public opinion and, and get this, uh, the Palestinians will understand that Hamas way is not the right way, and they have to support uh, the moderate Palestinians and to deal with Israel on the negotiating table. So I think that when they saw that in Iran and Syria, they saw all this progress and they saw a new American administration that seems to be much more um, uh, energized to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, they said, whoa, gosh, this is not good for the radical camp. This is not good for us. Peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians is not very good for our attempts to uh, export the revolution and the radical ideology uh, uh, of us to many other uh, places. And I, I really want to stress something. When I'm talking about Iran, I'm talking about the regime. Because the people of Iran are very different than the regime. The people of Iran are actually more pro-Western uh, than most of the Muslim countries in the world. But the regime, uh, since the 79 um, uh, revolution, is a very different story. And all those reformists in Iran actually have no hope, and I speak to some of them that are in Boston, uh, to really change that reality. The best they can hope for is maybe the Khatami will win and not Ahmadinejad, and this, at least the tactic will di be different. But, uh, but so when I'm talking about Iran, I'm talking about the regime, not about the people. Uh, but in any event, I think that was the reason why Hamas decided that the ceasefire doesn't work for them anymore, because it was not working 
for the radical ideology and for the uh, uh, radical camp uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and eventually Israel had to react. And we knew that uh, it's gonna be ugly. We knew it because we already had the experience in, in Lebanon with Hezbollah. And we knew that Hamas is going to use uh, the, the, uh, the civilian population as human shield and it's gonna be a, a, a big tragedy for Palestinians. Um, um, but, but eventually we had to, we faced two choices that both were unattractive. And, and this is very important to say, I think in academia institutions that I think sometimes forget this, that in the real world, you have to choose between options. And the fact that an option is not a great option that has many downsides doesn't mean that it's not only the only available option because the other option is even worse. Just to give you an example from current events, it's quite clear that the bailout or the stimulus package means uh, you know, a lot more burden on the, on the deficit and it, it, it will, it's very problematic in terms of accountability of many people that made mistakes in running all kinds of companies. But still, it might be the only option to save the economy. So you have to deal with, with options and that was the option that Israel faced. Either be in a situation where eventually the entire country will be under missiles, where people will not be able to live life, to send kids to, to school, uh, and eventually the, the missiles will get to the airport and, and it will shut down the Israeli economy and think, just think that at some point Hezbollah can always join from the north and cover the whole country with missiles while we all see Iran moving forward to a nuclear weapon. Uh, that's a scenario that Israel could not live with. And eventually we had to do what any government would do uh, uh, which is to protect our citizens. And it doesn't matter if you're a libertarian. I know New Hampshire is, is the state of libertarians, live free or die, right? Uh, or you are a socialist. I'm coming from Vermont. Vermont is more socialist uh, today. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a libertarian or a socialist. Everybody would agree that the one responsibility that a government has that nobody would uh, argue about is to protect citi er, its citizens from external threats. And this is what the Israeli government had to do. And it was quite clear for us that we are not fighting the Palestinian people, that we are trying to go after Hamas terrorists who are uh, terrorizing our uh, population. Um, um, and that was uh, that what we did. Uh, unfortunately, as we knew was going to happen, um, Hamas were uh, operating from mosques, from hospitals, from uh, kindergartens, from schools, from residential areas. <coughs> and Israel uh, was doing <coughs> what many generals uh, would say, uh, and I heard many generals are saying it in, in, uh, in MIT, in the Center for uh, um, uh, Security Studies and others, um, that there is no uh, precedent in warfare to what Israel did, which is to send uh, thousands and thousands of leaflets to um, uh, places where we're going to uh, operate and say to the civilians, we're going to operate there, right there because Hamas are throwing rockets from there, leave your houses, we're going to go there. We used um, text messages in se with cellular phones, um, uh, call people houses, leave, we know that Hamas are operating there. But of course, nobody could, uh, not everybody could leave and there were many tragedies in Gaza. And I think it doesn't matter what side you are of the issue, if you think Israel was right or, or wrong, I think we should all agree that whenever uh, a civilian, um, uh, innocent civilians, bystanders get killed, it's a tragedy. And uh, I, I, I believe that we, we in Israel should be as compassionate as anybody else about those casualties. And you see now many people in Israel are sending uh, food and medicine, and I heard that there's also an initiative here because many people in Israel think even though it wasn't our fault, even it was uh, Hamas, we have to do something about it. And I think it's, it's a very important sentiment that we have to promote no matter where we are on the issue. Um, what we try to achieve in this operation, unlike uh, in, in the war with Hezbollah in 2006 where our politicians came out with very lofty goals which they actually backfired because the perception was that Hezbollah won the war because Israel didn't achieve its goals. Uh, and that's a very dangerous perception in the Middle East. Um, we, uh, our goals in this operation were quite clear. What we want is a durable and sustainable ceasefire. A ceasefire that will not only stop the rockets from, 
from going into Israel and infiltration of, of, of terrorists from the border to Israel, but also a stop of the rearming of Hamas by all those missiles and rockets coming from Iran through, uh, through Egypt, because we knew that this is not going to be a sustainable ceasefire if they'll get all those weapons. Because at some point, Hamas leadership will say, okay, maybe now it's the time to stop the ceasefire. We, we have this rocket that can get to the airport uh, or could get to Tel Aviv or to Jerusalem, and now the time to stop the ceasefire. We want this time a real ceasefire that will hold. And that the international community who didn't really care about those missiles for eight years will do something and I believe that we did achieve a much larger sense of urgency in the international community. We had the leadership of the European Union coming to Jerusalem to try to work on, on, uh, on combating the smuggling. We have a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with, with the American administration to do much work with NATO and other parties to control all those uh, uh, way, uh, uh, routes where those weapons were coming from Iran. And we have agreements with Egypt that are not very public because the Egyptians don't want to be seen as collaborating with Israel, but there are much more sense of urgency in Egypt to do something against those tunnels and to make sure that Hamas, are because Egyptians are now starting to understand that this is going to spill over to them with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and they have to do something about it. Um, the other thing that we're trying to achieve is a mechanism in the passages because we were blamed by the international community that we are blockading Gaza. Uh, but when, uh, before Hamas took over Gaza by force, when Fatah was still in control, we had a clear mechanism in the passages. We had European monitors in the Rafah passage between Gaza and Egypt. We had the Palestinian Authority working the passages between Israel and Gaza, and uh, things were coming in and out uh, with, uh, with the right inspection and with the right uh, monitoring. When Hamas took power by force in Gaza, the European monitors ran for their life. Uh, most of the Fatah operatives uh, look asylum for asylum in Egypt or Israel. Uh, and, we, and Hamas were manipulating the, the passages uh, because um, they wanted to keep their uh, mechanism of terror to work and they don't care about the Palestinian people. Unfortunately, I w again, I, I remember the days when I worked with Shimon Peres trying to create industrial parks on the border of Gaza so people can get in there without the need to cross into Israel with all the problems and the security checks in order and to bring Israeli investors and to create work for the Palestinians. And the first target of Hamas was the industrial parks. The same with the greenhouses that we left in Gaza when we left there. The first target for Hamas was the greenhouses. They want to control what's coming in, what's coming out. They want to manipulate it, and we will not allow it. And it's not only the Israeli position, it's the Egyptian position, it's the EU position, it's the American position, that the new mechanism in the passages has to be controlled by, uh, by Fatah and by European Union monitors and by Egypt and not by Hamas. Uh, the last thing that is still part of the negotiations, and I, don't, I will not speak a lot about it because I don't know a lot, and intentionally so, because it's so um, sensitive, and that's the fate of Gilad Shalit, who's still in captivity. Um, and there are some talks about this, but as less as we talk, uh, it's better because we make the family's life unbearable with all those hopes and, and disappointments. It's just unbearable. So, but it's also part of um, what we're trying to now achieve in the negotiations that are still happening in Egypt while we speak. <coughs> so I want to uh, uh, finish and give you some time to, uh, to ask questions, but I just want to uh, finish in, in a, a little more upbeat um, tone because I s I'm an optimist. I learned from my mentor, Shimon Peres, that optimism is constructive and pessimism is usually a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you're a pessimist, you don't see opportunities, you only see threats. I believe that with, all, with the tragedy that we had in Gaza, still, uh, sometimes in the Middle East, for things to get better, they need to get worse. And I believe that if we will achieve our goals, if we will have a durable and sustainable ceasefire, and if, if after, um, uh, when we'll have uh, a government, a new government in Israel, after the negotiations, uh, of, uh, after the elections, and with a new sense of urgency from the Obama administration, that, you know, first days in office, they had, a uh, uh, Senator Mitchell, who I understand was here, 
with a lot of uh, credit from everybody after his success in North Ireland uh, as an envoy. Um, um, I believe, and with the Arab initiative in the background, I believe that we can move forward and solve this because it's critical for us it's critical for the Palestinians. It's critical for the moderates around us who see how Ahmadinejad and Nasrallah are using the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to mobilize people around them with a lot of help from Al Jazeera. Um, and we, uh, we feel that all of us are in this, that, uh, it, it that finishing this conflict will help American interests, will help the interests of moderates. And if, if Iran will be able to decide uh, the future of the Middle East, we will never have peace. Uh, but, if, uh, but if all those forces will come together, with emp will empower each other, the moderates in Israel, the moderates in the Palestinian Authority, the moderates in the Arab world, with the help of your administration, I believe that it can be done. And I will conclude um, with the term that became very popular in this side of the ocean, yes, we can. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, we can take uh, questions now, uh, students first, and uh, please come to the microphone and uh, ask your questions. Please, come, just come to the microphone so everyone can hear. As I'm sure a lot of people have heard, uh, right after the Gaza uh, war, the Prime Minister of Turkey was not too pleased with the situation. I'm wondering if you could speak on that and the sale of military weapons to the Turkish military. Okay, uh, did you all hear the question? Uh, the question about uh, uh, our relations with Turkey, because there was the very uh, dramatic exchange between our President Shimon Peres and uh, the, prime, the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan in Davos, uh, which got a lot of um, attention around the world. Um, we are trying to figure it out ourselves what the future of the relations. For us, the relations with Turkey are absolutely strategic. For us to have such a good relations with a, uh, with a Muslim country, uh, with, a, with an Islamist government, is a great show uh, that it can be done. Uh, we, by the way, we have very good relations also with, with Muslim uh, republics in Central Asia and the Caucasus, as you know. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's very important for us to show that, we could, that Jews and Muslims can work together um, just like uh, within Israel. Um, and also, uh, there are many interests, strategic, economic. Uh, Turkey is, by the way, one of the ways to solve the Middle East water problems. Whenever we'll have peace with Syria, and this is something I didn't t really touch because we didn't have time, uh, and, and we could bring water from Turkey, and they have so much water they don't know what to do with it. Uh, for countries like Jordan, who really suffers from lack of water, uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, there's a lot of tourism from Israel to Turkey that is a very important um, economic uh, factor for Turkey. So it seems that um, Erdogan, um, in, in the past we, we knew that Turkey sometimes, the Turkish leaders uh, use rhetoric in order to kind of vent and keep on the strategic relations. We hope that this is the case as well, and this time we will be able to go back to normal. Um, um, but, you know, the jury is still out. Um, we, we value very much the relations and we hope that we will be able to go back to where it were and to keep the, the as you said, I, don't, I will not go into details, but there is a lot of strategic uh, military uh, relations between us and Turkey and a lot of economic interest involved. Um, but I don't know, I just hope uh, that this is, will be the situation. I just know that one of the downsides of our operation, and, and I, people tell me all the time, and. I know it, I mean, it's, as they say, da, that the, that the public is enraged when they see what's happening in Gaza. I, I get it all the time here from people who are, I know, many good people, not anti-Semites and not anti-Israelis who just confuse or, or even think we're evil because they see the pictures. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to give context, and that's why I'm so happy for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, but. Uh, you know, in the real world, you also have other factors. So we knew that it would be a problem in, in many, uh, especially Muslim countries, where they saw those pictures and people didn't really understand the context of it. It was it was a problem, and I hope that we will eventually be able to move forward and the relations with Turkey will go back to where they were. And the other question was, um, remind me? 
Yeah, so uh, we hope that this will go on, but I, I don't know. I know that Turkey stopped their uh, military cells with France when France decided to acknowledge the Armenian genocide. Uh, the, uh, so the Turkish, you know, many times they use uh, that as, a, but I think that uh, it's, it's a win-win. Uh, our, uh, our exchanges and our strategic relations are win-win. Turkey is a very important country in NATO, and, and those relations are very important for us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you mentioned during your talk that at the time that Israel chose to respond to the missiles, there was no option. You called it you know, the lesser of two evils, essentially, two really bad options. But two days ago in the Jerusalem Post, Gordon Baskin wrote that 10 days or two weeks before uh, Israel responded, a senior Hamas official and he had a deal on the table that said return of Gilad Shalit, end of, economics, um, end of economic blockade, and a ceasefire. Uh, what happened to that? Why was this all necessary? It seems like that is the goal that's now imp impossible because of tensions on both sides, but it would have been possible, I guess, now two months ago. Well, thank you for the question. I read this uh, piece as well. And I can't tell you how many times we had um, all kind of people that are negotiating for themselves uh, coming to us with deals. We achieved deal with Syria. We achieved deal with Iran. They will stop the nuclear weapons. If you, you know, it, it's, it wasn't serious. I mean, we, there are certain channels where Hamas are making their, po their um, you know, positions very clear. And it wasn't through, uh, it, they will not do it through Baskin. If they want to, to get a message to Israel, there are certain channels that they use, they know. Uh, it's the Egyptians, the Germans at some point were negotiating um, a, 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 as well, the Turks, um, uh, the French government, because Gilad Shalit is also a French, um, is, uh, um, he has a French passport. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for uh, Gershon, but I think he spoke to someone with no authority, and it happens a lot in the Middle East, that good people with good intentions come with, you know, the solution but it wasn't, it wasn't real. There wasn't any backing. If there was backing for that, we would hear it from the real leadership of Hamas and nobody heard it from them. So unfortunately that wasn't in the cards because if it were, I could assure you that Israel would jump on this. They, you know, they would, there is nothing, you know, even if you think that it's all cynical, it's all political, there is nothing that, uh, that Olmert wants to do more than bring Gilad Shalit back home and clean the table and clean his legacy as someone who considered to fail in the Lebanese war. And if, it, if we could have done this, it would have been done, but it I don't think it was a serious offer. Um, and I think, you know, I still think Gershon is a good person with good intentions, but he was, uh, spoke, he spoke with someone with no authority. You had a question. <coughs> yeah, you mentioned the tunnels between Egypt and Gaza, and you said that the Egyptian government doesn't want to publish whatever agreement they have with you, but do they in general have a official position on the issue or? Yes, um, well, again, um, as you all know, um, you're from the Dickens Center, so you know it's not exact sciences and, and we can only make assumptions about <coughs> why the Egyptians are doing this or the, for a long time we couldn't understand why Egypt is not really acting forcefully on the tunnels, even though they say they are, especially, by the way, they got a lot of pressure from, from the U.S. and they have a lot of interest in their um, relations with the U.S. and especially with Congress. And they were saying we're doing everything possible, but they were not. I mean, it's only 14 kilometers, the whole Philadelphia corridor. It's, so it's not rocket science, even though it's about rockets. Um, and you could see how Jordan, a much weaker country than Egypt, is controlling a much larger uh, border between the West Bank and Jordan, so it can be done. So it's not clear, maybe the Egyptians were trying to pressure us to change the parameters of the Camp David Agreement to get more uh, military into Sinai. Maybe they just didn't want to deal with the Bedouin uh, uh, population in the Sinai where they don't have good control. Many of them, I think, were just bribed because it's such a flourish industry there, the whole smuggling operation. Uh, and it's not just uh, missiles, it's missiles, but it's also cigarettes and, and many other things that are going through those tunnels. Um, I, I do hope 
that they now understand that this is uh, working against their interests and that they will do more. But they didn't want any uh, monitors, any foreign monitors on their land. Uh, they got some sophisticated um, engineering uh, because, you know, to control the tunnels, there are some engineering solutions. But again, they need people to help them w work them. And they so I don't know the details because it's uh, Amos Gilad is still going to Egypt back and forth. But it seems to me from what I'm getting that the Egyptians are moving forward in a much more positive way. And I hope that in the future they will do uh, much more. Uh, we are, if you no notice uh, from the Israeli public, um, you know, uh, diplomacy, we're trying not to talk badly about the Egyptians. We know that we need them. We know that this peace agreement that we have with Egypt, even though it's very cold peace, but we cherish it a lot because Egypt was the first Arab country to sign a peace agreement with us. And since then, uh, no Israeli soldier had to uh, die in, in the Egyptian border. But we still have many issues with Egypt and we have to keep those relations uh, to nurture them and to try to do it in a way that will not humiliate uh, the Egyptians. And, and it's a tricky thing, but I hope we'll be successful. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, you mentioned earlier that the, the current American administration seems much more energized to do stuff about what's going on um, with the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I was just wondering where you think that they should start? Where would they be most helpful? Um, and kind of how, how you see best case scenario that working out? Well, it's a great question. And uh, you know, if I knew all the answers, I would probably be back in Jerusalem and not here. <laughs> Um, I, I think what they, uh, it seems that what they uh, are saying is that uh, they see that all those things are very connected. Um, and I think that's why uh, they work with those special envoys, because they understand that it's very hard to work many fronts at the same time. Uh, for, uh, you know, the NEA, the Near East uh, uh, office in the State Department, it's very hard. So, and that's why they appoint uh, Senator Mitchell, and they will, will appoint someone to deal with Iran, uh, it, it seems. Um, so I think they have to work in parallel. They have to do few things at, uh, at the same time. One of them is to keep on the spirit of Annapolis, and they may call it differently, but where Israelis and Palestinians will keep on trying to uh, narrow the gaps on the on the political horizon, how a political uh, solution to this will come about. Work on the ground, general data on others to create a better situation in the West Bank where eventually people in Gaza will do what people in East Germany did. They said, we want to be part of West Germany because it's so much more fun there. Um, and, and they will throw Hamas. Uh, while at the same time, if we could separate Syria from Iran, this alliance between Iran and Syria is not natural. Syria is not a Shia state. Syria is not a religious state. It's, it's, a, it's a secular a Sunni, um, mostly Sunni, with an Alawite regime. It's a minority regime. And the most thing that they care, this regime, is how to maintain the Alawite control over a Sunni state. And they think that um, they, they t in order to keep their interest in Lebanon, they have to keep Hezbollah uh, alive. And, they, and that's why there are all those weapons going to Hezbollah from Iran are going through Syria and they host the Palestinian headquarters in, in Damascus because they think if the Palestinians will reach a peace agreement, we will be left out and, you know, and we will be the only one with no, uh, will n without getting our Golan Heights back. Uh, so they're trying to uh, sabotage the peace between us and, and the Palestinians. And if we can separate them from Iran, if we can move Syria to the American orbit, uh, it will help tremendously uh, the peace process. It will help to marginalize Iran. It will help to weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon and will help the Senora uh, Suleiman government. Uh, so I think that they should work on all those issues. But it's quite clear that you do that and you work on, on opportunities because sometimes opportunities happen, different things happen, and then you use those opportunities. But uh, you have to work in all those. Uh, and I think, of course, a very important thing is what you do with Iran. Again, I, I, I'm, I tend to be optimistic without being partisan or whatever, uh, but it seems that because the Obama administration have, have so much more respect around the world, they will be much more able to create um, 
unilateral front to deal with those issues. For example, the relation with Russia, who were a problem in dealing with Iran, because when you say missile defense in the Czech Republic and Poland is very important, and uh, Kosovo independence is very important, and uh, getting Ukraine and Georgia to uh, NATO is very important. Iran is somewhere in the bottom, but when you um, work with the Russians and maybe say, you know, if you don't like missile defense, uh, we think it's about Iran, you think it's about you, you help us solve Iran, we don't, won't need the missile defense. So there are many new kind of parameters that were not there. And, uh, and with a, a very, um, you know, well-planned engagement and more international power, if they could stop Iran from getting the nuclear bomb, that's the most important thing that you could do. Because if Iran gets the nuclear bomb, that means that all those proxies will be so much more empowered and the prospects for peace and for moderation in the Middle East will go down the tube. Um, so I, I think I gave you um, another very clear answer. You wanted one thing and I spoke about many, but I think this is actually what you need to do. You we need to work all those uh, fronts and then when you reach an opportunity, when something happened, you use that opportunity to move forward and that will influence the other theater. Let me ask a, uh, an add-on question uh, to the question earlier about uh, Turkish relations with Israel. Um, would you say anything about uh, where the uh, Turkish mediation between Israel and Syria is right now, how that's been impacted by the war, and is it going on or is it just frozen? Uh, well, they are, uh, are talks with uh, Syria, which were actually proximity talks because we didn't really speak to the Syrians. We spoke uh, to the Turks and they were speaking to the Syrian because the Syrians didn't want face-to-face um, -face, uh, uh, discussion with us. They feel that this is something that you give only when you get something. Um, uh, uh, they, they became frozen when Olmer decide, decided to resign because um, it was quite clear that uh, an outgoing uh, government in Israel have no legitimacy. Uh, by the way, for some time, uh, they were not moving forward because it seems that the Syrians wanted Washington more than they wanted us. And when they heard that the Bush administration is not interested, they say maybe we're not so interested. But the Turks really pushed it forward to their uh, credit. And uh, our government decided to, uh, that this is something that we need to try. I mean, un unless we talk, we would not know if the Syrians are serious about breaking from Iran or not. Um, and, and now the question is what happened uh, you know, when there is an Israeli government, I would, f I would assume that because Washington will be much more interested to play a role, uh, Turkey will be less of um, an important player. And also, uh, I think that uh, at least in the Israeli public, uh, Turkey, Turkey lost uh, credibility because of the way they spoke about, about Gaza. And uh, 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 I think our leadership, because people who know the details and know how, how strategic the relations are, will try to get Turkey to play a role. Uh, but it will not be easy with the public. The public really felt that Turkey betrayed us. And even though when they face uh, uh, issues like we face with the, Kurdis, with the Kurdish terrorist organizations, they are very uh, quick to act across the border and to do things. And when they blame us, uh, people uh, are kind of not very happy these days, but we will do, as government, we'll do everything uh, possible to get the Turks back to feel that they're, uh, and, 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 and Israel actually uh, spoke on behalf of Turkey with many of the European Union countries and saying, you have to accept Turkey because if Turkey will not be accepted by the West, they eventually will have to go to the East and that will be against our, uh, all of our interest. And I hope that those constructive support, uh, this constructive support between us will, will go back to, uh, uh, to where they should be. Any other students with questions before Dina? Thank you. Just to remind you, I'm part student. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, I, I guess the global picture of what will the future be in the Middle East, modernity, globalization in the Western world versus, I'm not sure, did you say Islam fundamentalism? Or, but um, also I think, uh, I think about the ethnic minorities in the Middle East 
and, and modernity, globalization, seems to be somewhat against um, the rights of the ethnic minorities in the Middle Eastern states. At least that's what I'm learning. Um, and uh, I'm interested in your reaction to that. And also, this, the two-state solution for Israel and the Palestinians, is that an exception for the Middle East? Because the international community, I don't, I don't think, uh, supports separation of the states with ethnic minorities. Um, but in this case, it appears that it, it's something that is being accepted. So is the two-state solution an exception for the Middle East? Um, OK, on the first question, you know, uh, I'm sure there are experts about Islam more than me. But I think that a lot of this uh, radicalization that you see all over the place, you know, I was talking about Hamas and Hezbollah, but you see it in almost any Muslim country around the world in many ways is the kind of dialectic response for globalization and kind of a feeling that um, that uh, that is Islam who was uh, such a you know a leader in the in, in, in certain eras in the past and was uh, you know um, a leader in innovation and stuff like that became kind of in the back and the reaction of many people that if we're not winner uh, uh, of this kind of new reality in the world will go back to religion and will go back to fundamentalism. I believe that uh, eventually this wave will go down because eventually uh, um, those radical um, uh, leaders cannot really bring good answers to the people. They can't really bring bread to the table. They can't really bring um, uh, solutions to many of those problems. So I think that this wave will go down um, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, globalization, as Tom Friedman said, is not that you choose to be part of it or not. I mean, it's not that you can fight it. It's, it's a reality. And countries like India or Israel, for example, uh, you know, instead of fighting it and saying, you know, well, it's American, it's actually an American uh, controlled globalization, uh, we said, let's be better than the Americans. And that's why you see uh, today more Israeli uh, companies on NASDAQ than any other country outside of the US. And you see India with all those um, uh, innovations and technology. And wha that's why you see, uh, because eventually, this is what the world is going to be, whether we like it or not. It's going to be flat and crowded, as uh, Tom Friedman wrote. Uh, and eventually, I, I think uh, people uh, in, in the Middle East are seeing this, and they want to be part of it. And uh, I think majority of uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, want to be part of it. They're not very vocal. They're not very, um, um, you know, um, um, uh, they're not very uh, courageous in standing up to the extremists because they're afraid for their life. But eventually, with support from, from the Western world and with what I said about moderate uh, empowering each other, they will win. They will win because they have the answers. Uh, eventually, Palestinians will not get their deserved uh, uh, state by terrorism, because Israel is not going to succumb to terrorism. Uh, Nasrallah said that Israel is a weak society. He used the metaphor of uh, a spider web. Israel is like a spider web. It's, it's very weak. They see us, and they see, you know, Israelis are becoming uh, latte drinker and sushi eaters and spoiled, and they think that uh, we are much more Athens than Sparta. But Israel will not. Israel, when, when we are pushed to the wall, we will react. And people will eventually have to understand it. I mean, the reason why Sadat came to Jerusalem and said no more war, no more bloodshed, is not that suddenly he, uh, you know, he just realized that we're not going to win. And if he wants to bring uh, bread to the table, he has to switch from the Russian orbit to the American orbit, and he has to sign a peace agreement with Israel. And I believe that that is where the future is, and that is where things will move eventually, because the radicals don't have answers to those problems. Uh, as to this two-state solution, I think the world understands that this is the only solution, uh, because everybody uh, sees the misery of the Palestinian people, and we see it as well. But the predicament of Israel is, is that because of terrorism, uh, we are in a, in a position where in order to save our life, we have to make the Palestinian people uh, uh, miserable. And that's not a sustainable situation for anybody. The Palestinians suffer, 
And for us, uh, morally, and as I said, in terms of the future of, of being a um, uh, homeland for the Jewish people and a democracy, just it, can, it can't work for many years. And that's why we have to achieve a two-state solution and everybody understand it except uh, the radicals and some people in Europe that are talking about a one state, but they don't understand that a one state actually is, is, is what you know, Hamas wants because they know that one state eventually is no Israel or some of the fanatics in Israel who say one state transfer, transfer the, the Palestinians. Those who really want to live in peace can understand that the one state will be just like Yugoslavia after Tito left and just like uh, you know, uh, the bloodshed in Lebanon, it just wouldn't work. And that's why, the, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, in many ways it's an exception. Israel is an exception in the Middle East. We're very, um, you know, very different in many ways, but we want to live. I mean, the declaration of, of uh, independence of Israel uh, calls for stretching our hand to our neighbors in, and asking to live in peace in the Middle East. And that's what most Israelis want. And I think that's what the world support. And we will have to stand up to the radicals who want different things. Okay, we'll have to close there because uh, we have another commitment in 10 minutes. But thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to conclude by saying that I know that uh, this issue is, uh, create a lot of passions and emotions. And the fact that we were able to talk about this in a civilized way um, shows uh, a lot about your university and about your center. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.